friends today i am taking up a very different kind of aphorism from sri aurobindo which is a comment on history as well as the spiritual evolution of civilization you know there are sometimes there are people who find it a pleasure some activity to deny a reality to dispute a great tradition or a great event partly to create some kind of sensation and partly because they do not have an overall understanding of the forces working behind the development of the civilization and the world now there are four events sir avindo says which are great events in the world he does not say that these four are only great events there are many great events but these are also four great events which have molded our civilization but there are people who have the audacity to say that these events did not take place or the personalities who are the centers of these events did not exist the aphorism reads like this there are four great very great very great events in history the siege of troy the life and crucifixion of christ the exile of krishna in vrindavan and the colloquy with arjuna on the field of kurukshetra the siege of troy created hellas the exile in vrindavan created devotional religion or before there was only meditation and worship christ from his cross humanized europe the colloquy at kurukshetra will yet liberate humanity yet it is said that none of these four events ever happened now this was sri aurobindo wrote this in the very early part of 20th century and these voices who were saying that these events never took place they belong to end of 19th century early 20th century first decade of the 20th century now well they are all forgotten things but what are these four events siege of troy i believe my younger friends would need an introduction to this term the siege of troy you must have heard about helen of troy the trojan war the trojan horse many idioms are formed after this event you see in the western hemisphere greece was the great country who is came to prominence for its culture literature sculpture etc etc but 4000 years ago greece was not what it is today or what it became afterwards there was no nation which could be called greece or small kingdoms small areas ruled by chieftains very egoistic they would not give any kind of consideration to their neighbor so these were a kind of i mean a, a land archipelago of small feudatory states now one of them was sparta athens sparta ithaca etc etc now the spartan king had uh, 
brought a very beautiful daughter-in-law, Helen. Now, under the, the that is a long story to narrate the background how Helen went away with a young prince called Paris. Nothing to do with Paris or France. His name was Paris, who is who came from another small country called Troy. Today, Troy can be located in the Asiatic part of Turkey. Now, this Troy was a very powerful small kingdom at that time. And the fortress that Trojan kings, Trojan is the adjective from Troy. The Trojan kings, the kings of Troy, that built a very, very powerful fort. It was a hill, and around the hill, several layers of very, very strong walls. Now, this young Paris became a guest of the royal family of Sparta. And behind this event, there was a conspiracy of some supernatural powers. Helen, the daughter-in-law of the king of, I mean, Sparta, she was under a kind of mesmerized condition, hypnotic condition. And Paris, practically, or she eloped with Paris to Troy. Or you can say Paris kidnapped her to Troy. It is a question of point of view. Now, when this happened, the princess of the locality, a few states, they became very, very agitated. It was an insult to them. So for the first ever time in history, to cut short the story, all the small kingdoms which today constitute Greece, the nation of Greece, they came together. They were united. That is the beginning of the Greek nation. And together they led a mighty expedition against Troy. By sea, hundreds of ships, fleets of ships, of great warriors, great heroes, they went, they landed at Troy, and they surrounded the Trojan fort. And the battle began, and it continued for 10 years. Many, many dramatic events took place during that time. And ultimately, at the end of 10th, towards the end of 10th year, they took recourse to a very strange, very unusual strategy. You see, in those days, whenever some people will undertake a long journey, they will offer their obeisance to an image of a horse. So these Greek forces, they, pretend, they created a huge wooden horse and they pretended as if they are living, they are retreating, they are no longer interested in fighting the Trojan soldiers and that is why they are worshipping this horse and they left by the ship. Early evening, it is a moonlit night. The Trojan people are very happy that enemy has left. So, delighted, they opened the doors of the first great wall, circling wall, and brought that wooden horse inside. As soon as the wooden horse came inside, it had a hollow interior. It was a wooden case looking like a horse, but inside it there were a strongest of soldiers from the Greek side. They came out and they guarded the door. The door could never be shut again. And those people who pretended to have left, they came back and thousands of Greek army entered Trojan port, destroyed it totally and found out Helen and returned to Sparta, Greece, along with Helen. And the great poet of Greece, you must have all heard his name, Homer. Homer, in 700 BC, 700 years before Jesus Christ was born, so about 3,000 years ago from today, there lived a blind poet, Homer. And from village to village in Greece, he would sing the 
story of this battle in poetical form lyrical form and homer had written a second epic also the first one was this is the, the the story of i mean the first one is iliad and the second one is called odyssey odysseus was the name of the greatest of trojan heroes after the battle along with his soldiers by sea he was returning to greece but the the fleet of ships faced a terrible storm and most of his soldiers were killed he with a handful of people encountered numerous adventures there was a monster cyclope one eyed cyclope they escaped from him shira and sari please they passed through it there was an island of sarsi anybody who was attracted to that island and went there there was an enchantress she would reduce the human beings into pigs there was the island of siren etc etc if i'd go narrating them the whole time will be consumed but these adventures the greatest book of adventure ever written it is known as ulysses or odyssey so iliad and odyssey these two epics like our ramayana and mahabharata who is practically given identity to the indian nation you know in the kurukshetra battle all the princes of the entire indian subcontinent participated similarly in the trojan war all the kings of that huge piece of land today we know as greece they participated greece became a nation so sri aurobindo says the trojan war the siege of troy you see it is not a story today when these people said this some people said it was a fiction not a fact now soon after that they were silent because in 1870s a great german discoverer explorer sleeman following the descriptions in odyssey he discovered the city of troy and it was proved historically that 13th century bc 1300 years before the the birth of jesus christ that is 4000 years ago there was a great battle there all the proofs were available the city he discovered proofs he got so today nobody questions the veracity or authenticity of historical legend that there was the siege of troy but when sri aurobindo wrote this sleeman's discovery did not come to light now this homer iliad and odyssey they were the backbone of greek literature and you know in western world in philosophy in literature you have heard the name of socrates of plato of aristotle you have heard the name of great dramatists great sculptors all these things came afterwards and it is the siege of troy because it led to the composition of iliad and odyssey they gave hellas the cultural life to the entire continent of subcontinent of greece how can we say that siege of what siege of troy did not take place the second is crucifixion life and crucifixion of jesus christ we do not know how barbaric was that western world any world any part of the globe in ancient times truth for truth life for life these were laws whoever is mighty whoever is strong nobody can question his authority he can subdue people subdue places he can tyrannize over them he can do anything Christ humanized the entire western world his teachings it is not that all those who are christians they are all really followers of jesus christ teachings but on the whole in the process of social evolution the ideas of jesus christ they sank into the psyche of the people constitutions laws were created accordingly 
it is no longer truth for truth it is something else more humanistic which came to prevail as the laws which governed human society and from his crucifixion till today thousands and millions of people when they remember how jesus christ sacrificed his life to the barbaric blindness of ignorant mob at least for a moment they become conscious of still the darkness of ignorance prevailing in the world he has shed his blood he has been tortured for sake of bringing this awareness into humanity that mob is not always right and might is not always right ultimately the truth prevails and this has crash teaching is a teaching based on his own experiences of truth you need not read anything at to read a particular part of the new testament the sermon on the mount you will see how great ideals he upheld very very uh, close to our teachings ancient indian teachings of spirituality now the third great event your of the speaks of is krishna's exile to vrindavan he means by exile as you know king kongs of mathura was warned by some celestial voice akashvani that the eighth child of his cousin devaki would be the cause of his death so he imprisoned devaki and her husband in an apartment inside his own castle as soon as devaki's child will be born he will kill it but the eighth child at night was smuggled out of mathura into the place which is known today as vrindavan it was gopopura and there the child infant was left in the custody of the local chieftain nanda and his wife jasoda now this is exile from mathura as soon as he is born to vrindavan now had krishna not been to vrindavan we would not know probably what bhakti is what prema yoga bhakti yoga are before that before krishna's advent in vrindavan we had tapasya we had gyan yoga we had worship traditions of offering worship to the divine obeisance to the divine but krishna revolutionized the entire spiritual discipline of mankind of indians in those days but today of the world you can say he established the truth that every human emotion can be a pathway to the divine every human emotion you identify yourself with my mother jasoda krishna is your child to the love for a child you love the divine identify yourself with the cowherd boys of gopo the divine is your friend your playmate approach him as your playmate and he is available to you identify yourself with the damsels of gopo remember krishna was a child at that time do not be confused by the films damsels dancing with the young krishna these are all fantastic fables you see these dances were taking place at a supernatural plane not at the physical plane the problem with our epics or our mythology is the poets were seers and they often fused physical facts with great experiences of occult planes and they will present them in such a way as if everything was happening at the occult plane we have to be very conscious of these things and so these gopis as they are called according to one of our scriptures they were not ordinary human beings they were liberated souls you know who is a liberated soul a liberated soul is one who is not obliged to 
come back to the cycle of birth and death he has by liquidation of his desires all together and complete surrender to the divine he has been set free from this bondage to earthly life but a liberated soul can come back to the world take birth as a human being according to his own will or her own will so when vishnu was to be incarnated as krishna these liberated souls came pressing around him and said allow us to be born in the upon the earth in gopo to have your physical contact to enjoy our companion our, our our relationship with you at that earthly plane so they were all liberated souls anyway to come back to what i was trying to impress upon you identify yourself with the gopis love becomes a medium our of our link with the divine identify yourself with a character like uddhava devotion bhakti becomes our link with the divine identify yourself with arjuna krishna becomes the friend philosopher and guide everything in one so with the advent of krishna and his leela the play at vrindavan the rasa of bhakti the madhurya the sweetness of devotion that became established is one of the mighty great almost unique way of approach to the divine a new revelation all together you know krishna it is impossible to describe this the 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 uh, significance of his life hundreds and thousands of gopis dancing with krishna each one has a krishna by his heart side 1600 gopis what does it mean each one has an exclusive relationship with the divine divine is not something which can be exhausted so divine is capable of becoming one with you at the same time one with a million others wonderful experiences based on this fact came to later seers and poets i'll give an example which is not from the original uh, bhagavatam but it explains how krishna is an ever living process it is not simply a personality historically he was there but his end of his life is not the end of krishna's influence or his power it is a perpetual incident individual each individual has a right of access to krishna now the one of the experience of one of the seers when krishna was the king of dwaraka peaceful administration no much problem at that time unfortunately he had very unworthy descendants unworthy family members but there's a different story now during the glorious period of dwaraka one day when he is in his court suddenly a young boy comes rushing into the court and complains to krishna look here a boy was playing with me in the street and he slapped me how cruelly he slapped me krishna looked at the boy and saw there is a mark on his cheek children were playing somebody slapped him but surprisingly for everybody he suddenly stands up who is that wicked boy where is that boy i want to confront him everybody surprised the mighty lord krishna who kept his calm during the kurukshetra battle he is becoming agitated because a boy has been slapped by another boy but krishna goes out to the street the entire court all the ministers are following him and meanwhile the boy who was complaining he has become himself very repentant what did i do and the king is coming probably my friend the other playmate she will be 
executed or I don't know what will happen to him. Now meanwhile, somebody's ran to the guardian of that child, that street archin. His guardian was an old man who was living in a small hut at the end of the town near a Sivo temple. You see, in those days, the supreme deity was Sivo. There was no Rama temple, no Krishna temple. So, now, so he has run to the old man and told him, your grandson has done a mischief and the king is so angry that he is coming towards your cottage. And somebody told Krishna that, you see, that boy who slapped the other boy, his grandfather is his guardian. I want to see that guardian. I want to see him. And Krishna walks towards the Shiva temple. Silent, grim, all are following him. Somebody goes and warns the old man, the king is coming. The old man comes out, folded hands, trembling. Silence. Krishna looks at him and says, Look! Look what your grandson has done to this boy. Look! That's all. Nothing more. He returned. Nobody understood why did he take the trouble of coming all that way to say that much. Nobody knew that this old man was an ardent devotee of Krishna, but he was blind. He came all the way to reside there so that once in a while he can hear the footsteps of Krishna when he comes to the Shiva temple or the sound of the chariot by which he travels. He was waiting for all these days. The moment Krishna said, Look! His eyes opened. Not only the physical eyes, but the inner eyes which looked the splendor of Lord Krishna, the divine. So, this great wave of devotion and the confidence, the faith in divinity, that one could approach him through any of his emotion or her emotion. This was revolutionizing the spiritual it's the truth for mankind. Third great event. Fourth great event. The colloquy at Kurukshetra, that is the dialogue between Krishna and Arjuna. And what is significant here, Sri Aurobindo says, it is yet to liberate mankind, which means, in spite of the fact that thousands of years have passed since. Gita was given to mankind. We have not yet realized the full import of Gita. We have not yet been able to follow it entirely. The first great truth that spirituality is not something otherworldly. Even the most terrible situation in life like the battlefield Jutta Khetra can become Yoga Khetra, provided one is surrendered to the divine and is acting with the consciousness that I am Nimitta Matra, I am only an instrument. He is working through me, it is his will that prevails through me. And it is yet to liberate mankind. We have not yet realized the final message of the Gita. Sarvadharmam parityasyamam ekang saranang praza. That wonder of surrender, the ultimate surrender, the total surrender, which alone can pave the way for Sri Aurobindo's vision, as it is very clearly stated, our total surrender to the Divine Mother, the new force, which was the goal of Sri Aurobindo, new force to be brought down, and to establish in human consciousness can begin to work itself out. But without the total surrender, we cannot do that yoga. It's the divine which does the yoga. And the mother, in the form of the mother, she alone can take into her life all with all our weaknesses and all our darkness, entire race of her children, and perform the yoga. But I, uh, I must be surrendered. We must be surrendered. But that is something which we are yet to realize. So the dialogue at Kurukshetra is yet to liberate us. 
let us hope that deliverance will come sooner rather than later so dear friends 10th and the concluding uh, talk on thoughts and aphorism have taken place today i thank you particularly those who have been very regular in coming and listening to this very very small interpretations and comments on the great words of sri aurobindo and i am grateful to the authorities of sri aurobindo ashram delhi branch for facilitating my meeting with you last but not the least taradi of all persons my local guardian and i am beholden to her so thank you very much